Or that we're going to grow apart. Like sometimes it's like if we're not both in sync or going at the same pace, that this automatically means one, that this isn't going to work for us or two, you're going to grow apart from me. Welcome to Normalizing Non-Monogamy, the podcast where we interview incredible people from all over the world to hear their personal journeys of self-discovery through the lenses of love, sex, and relationships. Our mission is to show people that they're not alone and to inspire them to embrace their true selves so that together we can open minds and live authentically without shame. We believe everyone's story is powerful and beautiful, yet it's important to remember that everyone does life a little bit differently and that the views and opinions expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect our own. Additionally, we aren't doctors. Please consult a medical professional for anything regarding your health that you might learn about on the show. Enjoy! Hi, and welcome to Ask Us Anything. This is Miche. Oh, and I'm Finn. Yeah, I wasn't I ready. You off guard there. Yeah, well, we're out of sorts. This is our first time ever doing this in person. He's actually at my house. It's been pretty cool. Yep, sitting at your dining room table, eating popcorn, leftover popcorn from our community retreat. Which so was amazing. Yeah, like the little bit that I got to see was pretty cool. Yeah. So anybody who doesn't know, we did Emma and I hosted a community retreat last weekend in Atlanta, uh-huh. and it was absolutely incredible. Miche ran a workshop. So yeah, I did fantastic. a little couples mindfulness meditation workshop. It was amazing. Yeah. So stay tuned for more of those in the future, but we're here today to answer your questions. Mm -hmm. Maybe before we do, just a quick reminder of who each of us are in case it's a new year and you've forgotten what happened last year. So Misha, what quickly makes you qualified-ish to do what we're doing (laughs) here today? Welcome to 2024, where everything will probably be an ish. Yeah. Um, Besides having an an opinion. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I am a life coach. I work with Expansive Connection. Um, It's a coaching team that works with individuals, couples, morsums that are in ethical non-monogamy. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist. Um, But in this platform, I particularly work as a coach and I get to carry some skills over with us as well. I also am certified in trauma therapy, sex therapy, and um, have extensive understanding of dialectical behavior therapy. And you also have dabbled in the non-monogamy yourself? Yes. I've been doing that for about four and a half years now. So you know a little bit about what you're talking about. A little you've, bit. You've, Just you've, a little taste. You've, you've gone through it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And so on my end, most of you probably know a little bit more about me, but I've been with my partner, Emma, who I normally coast to, co-host this show with. And we've been in non-monogamous dynamics for almost our entire relationship, let's say since 2007, so 17 years or so. Not bad. And we've done a lot of different things and we've seen a lot of different things. And so I bring a lot of experiential uh, knowledge and wisdom as well as having talked to like hundreds and hundreds of people. I think that that does it. Makes us qualified. Uh Mm -hmm. So we got two questions today and they're both excellent. One of them, I would say not necessarily an easier question, but one of them we found easier to answer. There we go. (laughs) (laughs) So the first one, we'll start easy. And then the second one, maybe a little nervous about because there's just a lot of different ways and, and it's, and it's just a tricky situation. I agree. I agree. Yeah. So with that, let's jump into the first one. Okay. Hi. Yeah. So I'm wondering how you suggest dealing with a poly breakup when someone is in a marriage with a spouse who uh, wants a don't ask, don't tell agreement, you know, doesn't want to know anything about what's going on with the poly stuff. Uh, so yeah, it kind of just feels like, um, I'm out on an Island here a little bit without many resources or people to talk to about it. So uh, yeah, any insight you could provide would be great. Thanks. All right. That's a hard one because it's really isolating and incredibly lonely and you have to continue to function in a full partnership without pulling all of your grief and your sadness and angstiness into that relationship. And, you know, because we're human, it's going to spill over a little bit. And if you're in that kind of dynamic where one has a don't ask, don't tell, then they actually are probably not receptive to supporting you through this. Yeah. Yeah. I just, uh, to echo that, I think the don't ask, don't tell 
is a is I mean a lot of different monogamous dynamics are challenging. I f- I think there are some things about the don't ask don't tell that are particularly challenging, and one of them is exactly what you said, which is it can be really isolating. Yeah. You per, you know you often find this in a long term partnership or a long term marriage, and that person often becomes your your main support system. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And if you've then opened up that partnership. And for, I mean, on the front end, right, you don't get to share about your NRE, your yeah. your new relationship energy, all of the excitement. But on the backside, if the partnership ends, you really have to keep that locked down too. That you just have to basically be an emotional robot when it comes to anything outside of your partnership. And to think that that's not going to impact your day to day is is just not realistic, I yeah, think. Absolutely. So I think this one's a little shorter because the, the majority of the answer is you have to find your people. You got to find community. Yeah. Yeah. I think we both came to this question with the same sort of answer is it is it is exactly what you said. It is isolating. It feels like you're on an island. And I think it feels that way because in a lot of ways it you, is. you are you're yeah. on an island. And so finding people that you can talk to, I think, is going to be the absolute best thing you can do. And so we really wanted to just throw a few resources out there. So, you know, one would be even just finding a therapist or coach. And I would recommend one who is polyamory friendly, or at least open to the idea of non-monogamy and understands the dynamics because you want that person to be able to receive it and be able to help and listen and support you without going down all the roads of, well, you should just be lucky. You still have your wife. And why is this so hard? And I think those are, those are the things you would get if you could go to a friend, right? Mm -hmm. In this situation, because unless you have some real rock star friends who are, are totally cool playing that and, and diving into there, it's really easy to get the, yeah, well, at least you're still married. Or maybe you tell your friend who doesn't have a, a, a partner of any kind. And they're like, wait a minute, you want some sympathy and empathy <laughs> for having two partners yeah, you lost Seriously? one of your multiple partners girl that's so hard right and, which is not what you need right now you need yeah. to be told like it doesn't matter how many partners you have losing somebody in your life is incredibly hard yeah also like i just want to validate the masking that has to happen here like mm-hmm. you have to mask at home you have to mask at work if you don't have a community and all of your friends are monogamous you have to mask in front of your friends i just want to validate how incredibly sad and lonely that is. And you just want to be able to take it down and breathe. I think I was um, grieving for a little bit. Um, My cat died. I had some personal relationship things that were going on. And I just like, I feel like a lot of grief. And so I went to this poly support group we have in um, our city. And I remember just sitting there and I was like, I know I'm not going to share, which I did not. But Everyone else talked about grief. And I think for the first time in like two to three weeks, I like felt relaxed because it was like people get to, people see me, they see the grief, we're all experiencing it together. And I felt like I could breathe for the first time. Um, And so it was just nice to, to hear and see reflections of the feelings I was having manifested in other people. And I think that's really important when your primary person isn't the person that you can do that with. Yeah, totally. Just even to, yeah, like you said, to be allowed to grieve, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And so not having to put on that that stone face to to be around, to be, I'm assuming, supporting your partner yeah. and, and your family, perhaps. So mm-hmm. yeah, totally. Well, a few of the resources that wanted to put out there, and these will be in the show notes if you're listening. So um, really, again, finding community. So yes, we have a community. Normalizing Non-Monogamy has a community would love for you to check that out, but the, but bigger than that, there are multiple other ones. So ones that we kind of know of, and again, this is not an exhaustive list. These are just sort of off the top of our head. Um, Multi Amory, they have a podcast as well. They also have a really great community. Again, finding a therapist or a coach, uh, there's lots of great resources out there. I would check out Therapy Den is a great place to look. And Expansive Connections, not a bad place to look. You can also look us up. We're here for it. (laughs) Uh, Looking up different poly meetups on like meetup.com. There's in lots of the larger cities around the country, you can find those. And there's also a new organization, maybe new in the last two or three years called Open. And it's an acronym that means, or that stands for the Organization for Polyamory and Ethical Non-Monogamy. 
And so they they sort of are partnered in some capacity with another organization called For Love. And that website is forlove.love. And they do, the reason I'm bringing this all up, they have a free peer support group that meets periodically. And there's information on their website where you can sign up and join those virtual calls. So that would be open to anybody, pretty much anywhere you could join in with those. So Links will be in the show notes there. And again, this is not an exhaustive list of communities that are out there that could help support in a polyamorous dynamic like this. But maybe like some options that are online so you don't have to actually go someplace, but you can also find some locally if that works for you as well. Yeah. This is a great list. Yeah. And the last thing I wanted to throw out there was that this is not necessarily just for people who are in a don't ask, don't tell agreement that you could wind up in this situation. I just, there's a whole host of reasons why you might go through a breakup, a polyamorous breakup or a non-monogamous breakup and one or multiple of your partners don't want to hear about it. Yeah, You know, it's maybe it's just they're they're not comfortable with that part of it. It's too hard. They're too busy right then. And we had we had a um, couple in our community. This was a few months back. Came on one of our calls, and and they were in a situation where there was tons of support for polyamory and the other relationships. But after a while, this one of the two people in the partnership had been going through a breakup, and it had like the fallout from it had lasted sort of quite a while. They were grieving it for you know, months and months and months. And at a certain point, their partner was like, I love you. I want to support you, but I, I like want to be happy with you again. I don't remember the last time we were happy. I don't remember the last time we just got to hang out and laugh and do something fun together. So, you know, they were sort of like, I want to support you, but I'm also out of like, I'm out of resources. Yeah. So there's, this isn't just for, if you're listening, like, well, I'm not in a DADT. Mm Mm-hmm. Not for me. Mm-hmm. There's a whole lot of reasons you might wind up in a situation where one or multiple of your partners can't, just can't. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's such a good one. Yeah, that that is important. Also, like, if you have multiple breakups in a small amount of time, like, mm-hmm. that's overwhelming. And you might want more support than the people around you have the capacity to give. Yeah. Which is great, great boundaries because that means that, like, they're making sure that they can still be your friend and, like, mm-hmm. be supportive for, for you in other ways. But in this way, they just can't show up. And so it's good for both of you. Totally. And and that's true too for your partners, right? Your partner's saying, I can be partnered with you under these conditions mm-hmm. and, and everybody's agreed to those conditions. And now that means we go seek support elsewhere. Yeah. So thank you so much for sending in this question. We When we were talking about it, we're like, we're sure there's going to be a ton of people who take away a lot from this. So yeah. thank you for being vulnerable enough to send in this question. Cause I think a lot of people have relationship structures. And when they think about poly or lifestyle, it's like, Oh, it fits this particular brand where everybody is able to talk about the relationship on some form. And I think having one that's so incredibly separate, mm-hmm. um, can be really like isolating to even share with other people. So thank you for bringing this up in the community. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And the next one that we're a little bit yeah we're nervous. a little scared about this one we're not gonna lie like this one kind of is is really deep and it can go so many different ways we had a lot of popcorn while we talked about it. <laughs> <laughs> all right here it is without much further ado i have a question what are some tips advice insights for a couple where one is demi demisexual or at least a little bit more demisexual and one is completely fine with absolute stranger sex especially when it comes to the apps and meeting people online like one is doing casual hookups and the other one needs to have some kind of conversation at least chemistry something like that which may or may not equal demi the nuances of what demi is And how do they understand each other and respect each other and honor each other and navigate conversations around choice of partner, sexual activities, safe sex? I'm curious your insights. Thank you. So that's a good question. Easy peasy. Yeah. (laughs) We're going to give you our three-step plan. (laughs) Yeah, we... (laughs) 
<laughs> while we while we were listening, we ate some popcorn and came up with a three step plan. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You could have given us a few more steps, Miche. <laughs> um, so first of all, we want to define demisexual, and so there, as the listener or as the caller sort of reference, there's there's not like a hard and fast definition, and and, and it's a spectrum. But typically, people who identify as demisexual need a little bit more connection, a bit more of an emotional connection before they can engage in sex or sexual activity. And so you don't necessarily have to fall in love and ride off into the sunset, but you know, maybe a conversation. It sounds like for this person, like having a deeper conversation or feeling a little bit of a connection is important. Yeah. That's a good definition. It's like good it. good enough. It's good enough. Good enough. So I think, yeah, as we said, this one's hard. Mm-hmm. Um having I mean, for me, anytime what I want differs from what somebody else wants, I know I'm always like questioning myself. Like, what I want wrong is what I want. Oh, yeah. Am I doing it wrong? Mm-hmm. Are they doing it wrong? Mm-hmm. And it's been a lot of work for me to get to a place of saying, just because we want different things doesn't mean either of us is wrong. Or that we're going to grow apart. Like, sometimes it's like if we're not both in sync or going at the same pace, that this automatically means one, that this isn't going to work for us, or two, you're going to grow apart from me. Um, I think all of those things can happen, and it just means that you will have to do more connecting, more repair, making sure that you're always turning back towards each other. It just has to be a little more intentional. Yeah. So I think maybe if we we pick up on our three-step plan that we really didn't make, so we're just going to (laughs) make... By the time we get it, it's, it's going to be 10 steps. But I think step number one is slowing down. Uh, this is, it's hard to do because my guess is you're excited. You want to go do this. Or it may be seemingly at least one of you is super excited and swiping on the apps and really excited to go hook up yeah. or find people. And it sounds like maybe a little more apprehension on the other person. And so regardless, I think anytime we're digging into stuff that is triggering to one or both people in a dynamic or anybody in the dynamic is slowing down. Because if you're constantly hitting those triggers, yeah, the ability to have the conversation from a calm, grounded place becomes really challenging. Also one that's not built in resentment. Yeah. 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 So you're not just getting frustrated. Yeah. Like you said, and just like, fine, go do whatever. And I'm, and then we'll argue about it later yeah. versus like, if we could slow down, come to a grounded place, come up with some type of a conversational structure. Um, you know, there's like the radar uh, uh-huh. the radar framework from multi-amory or, or even hiring a coach or a therapist, even for just a couple of sessions yeah. to just to re- flush it out, just yeah. create that like safe space. Yeah. The framework to, to make sure that you're both feel heard. Yeah. And, and then to have like a game plan. And one of the game plans I think is really important is making sure that you're doing lots of check-ins. So doing the slowdown part and then also doing the check-ins, like how do we want the check-ins to look? How do we want to make sure that we are sending like really good loving vibes to each other throughout this check-in. Um, it's like that I'm safe, I'm home kind of feeling. Also, I think you had mentioned earlier about being mutually supportive of the other person's journey. And I loved that. Yeah, that I think is how do we, let's say, right, we we want different things. Misha and I are partnered, we aren't, but let's pretend we are. We want different things. How do I support you in your joy and how do you support me in mine without us giving up who we are to do that? Yeah. And that's tricky. The the end was, I mean, at the end of the day, maybe it's not possible, mm-hmm. but I think in a lot of times it is. Yeah. I think it's important to be able to build a bridge or t- try it at least <laughs> build a bridge. And I like, I think it's really important to say that sometimes the bridge doesn't happen. Like you don't meet in the middle. That's Okay. But the point is to try to build the bridge. How do I support you? Whether that's like, I'm going to go to like a sex club and have watch you do like really, really fast paced dating. And I'm like, yay, I'm cheering you on. And maybe we go to the playroom and I'm just like, oh, I'm going to essentially be here. Or maybe it's like you come with me and you watch as I slowly get to know people and I get to feel comfortable in my space. Yeah, I think that finding finding some common ground, right? And that's a great like uh, physical example of if, you know, I know they talked a little bit about swiping on the apps, but maybe it is uh, the ability to go and be in a space and and see your partner doing it their way Mm -hmm. that can help create some empathy that could say, okay, I get it. They, They get this out of it. 
and it's not for me, but I see how it how it lights them up, mm. and they can get to see how it lights me up and how how my way works for me. And I just I think that is a tool, or that can be a tool for creating that empathy and that understanding of, you know, my way works for me, my partner's way works for them, and maybe it's not as scary or you know whatever feelings are coming up that are that are kind of blocking this connection. I think we can also talk about like a little bit of how do we validate their experience? Mm-hmm. Um, I think validation is so important because it lets the other person see that I see them. I don't like validation isn't agreeing with the other person. It's saying, I see you and I'm hearing what you're saying. And then one of the other things I thought would be kind of good to do is to talk about your fears. Yeah. What you're afraid of the different pace bringing out or saying about you as a couple also asking for what you need. Like, don't be afraid to say like, this is, this is what I'd actually really like. And when you do that, you give the other person the ability to have choice in the matter. Like they get to choose whether or not that's something they want to come on board with. When you don't do that, then you remove the element of choice, which also feels really isolating and creates wedges in the relationship. Yeah. It makes the other person feel like they have to, Yeah, right? Like, yeah. Yeah, I love that. I think what you said there about fears is another note that we had written down here, which I think is so good. And that's to me the like step one that was, you know, sort of slow down and really looking at what what are you afraid of? What is coming up for you that's causing this challenge? And and right, so I'm I guess, you know, there's some people out there who can have completely different dynamics and it just they're like, you just go do you, I'm gonna go do me, no problem. But that's not everybody. And and it's thinking through, okay, well, what's really scary here? And this and and this question I know thrown out was uh sexual health, uh-huh. types of activities that uh-huh. could be done, partner selection. And so it sounds like there's either been or a fear that there will be something threatening. Maybe it's an STI. Maybe it's a partner who doesn't respect your dynamic, Maybe whatever the thing is. But really taking some time after you've slowed down Mm -hmm. to say, what's really coming up for me? And then talking to your partner about that versus like, I don't want you going out and hooking up. It's, I'm afraid when you go out and hook up of A, B, C, D, whatever Mm -hmm. things you're afraid of, coming at it from sharing what what the feeling you have is versus what you don't want them to do. And and I know we're, we're, again, we're also looking at this primarily from the person who's maybe a little more demisexual, having fears around the person who's maybe more into hookups Mm -hmm. but that can go both ways right i'm i'm afraid you're gonna fall in love i'm afraid when you sit at the bar and talk to somebody for three hours that that you're not just interested in hooking up with them but that they're gonna replace me yeah so there's tons of things that can go both directions Mm -hmm. here Mm -hmm. yeah i think the fears on both sides are really important to address because if not you know then sometimes we do self-fulfilling prophecies or like the other person interprets our silence um, in a different way than we meant for it to be. So voicing it is so important. But this also kind of makes me think of what is not being said here, which is the need for boundaries. Yeah. Yes. Which, let's call that step three. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Slow down, thought about what you really were needing. And then, yeah. Then you come to the conversation and say, yeah, okay, you want to go out, and I know I'm going to blow this out of proportion, but you want to hook up with three people a night this weekend, whatever. Okay, if you want to do that, go for it. Here's what I'm going to need to do to protect myself. Mm -hmm. And you get to sit with that and think about it for yourself and then share it. And perhaps what you need to do to protect yourself might not work for the other person. And then they get to choose, do I still want to do that, right? You know, if... So I think that's really the boundaries are, again, not what you tell your partner or partners they can or can't do. It's, okay, you would like to go do this thing in order for me to take care of myself. I need to do this thing. Mm -hmm. Or I would ask that you do this, right? If you're going to do that, could you maybe let me know when you get home at night? Because one of my things is I'm afraid that Mm -hmm. you might not make it home after this. And so could you send me a text? You don't have to say yes, Mm -hmm. but, you know, okay, well, if you're not going to send me a text, then I need to take some other action to protect myself because I'm going to be afraid. So, again, this is slowing down. Mm -hmm. And I also think 
if back to this example, let's not have that conversation on Thursday night when you're going to go out Friday. Friday. Yeah. (laughs) Probably give yourself some time. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And that's smart. And that's really smart. Um, I wanted to add that sometimes it might be nice to sit in these hard conversations from a perspective of not what I don't get to do, but what do we get to do? Yeah. And I just think that perspective change a little bit feels lighter, like when it settles inside of you and it feels more like opportunities rather than restriction. Yeah. I think that's the thing I love about boundaries and and reframing them is not restrictive, Mm -hmm. but when I create this container using boundaries, I feel safe. And when I feel safe, I get to go and do a whole lot more of the things that make me feel good. And you do as well, mm-hmm. because now we know like within this framework, go bonkers. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You, we've decided we can meet here. Mm-hmm. We've agreed to these boundaries together. We've agreed to respect each other's. And, you know, of course we may violate them, but then we have a plan for, well, what happens mm-hmm. there? Mm-hmm. What am I going to do if you don't keep your end of it? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. there's just talking. Yeah. We get to talk a lot before we hook up with people. Yes, we do. And there's the assumption that throughout throughout this whole space that your the goal is to protect what you all already have and that the conversation is being held in curiosity and love mm-hmm. and mutual respect. Totally. Totally. I love it. Okay. I think we did okay. Um, I don't know if we're completely done. No, we're not done. One more thing I wanted to say about this and then we'll be done. This is step 14 if anybody was counting. Step 14. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I thought that because of the dynamic of someone who might go slow and someone who might go a lot faster, that when you have these conversations, it can bring up echoes from the past, um, things that might, you know, might trigger you or like remind you of what you did three years ago when we were having a conversation that looked a lot like this that had nothing to do with um, poly or the lifestyle or e in any form. And so just making sure that you're noticing if you're having some echoes or you're being triggered about things that remind you of fights that you guys have had, you know, in the past and being able to name them so that it's not impacting the current conversation in a way, in a way you didn't mean for it to. Okay, now I'm done. Now yeah. you're done? I'm done. Perfect. I love it. Well... I appreciate you, Miche. <laughs> I appreciate you being here in your own kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for bringing the popcorn. It was good. It was good. That's right. And thank you to to both listeners slash yeah. callers who reached out and shared, you know, a little bit about what's going on in their mm-hmm. lives, mm-hmm. assuming yeah. and and to be vulnerable and asking. Yeah, that's really sweet. Um, I hope it was helpful for the community as well. And um, thanks for letting us hold space for it. Yeah. And we'd love to hear your feedback as well. Again, we are two people who have just been navigating this ourselves. Uh-huh. We've obviously got some trainings in this and you've done a lot of work as a therapist and you've worked with lots of couples. You're also doing... I suppose I am doing uh-huh. a training program uh, through the Somatica Institute for Sex and Relationship Coaching. But like again, so many of these have so many nuances that there's not a right answer yeah. and it's one size doesn't fit all. Mm-hmm. And so in, way, in many ways, these are our opinions mm-hmm. based on our experiences, but I, we would love to hear your feedback. Yeah, it's also what works for each, for both of you. Yeah. So maybe you're listening. You're like, no. oh, I went through the same thing and I did it completely different uh-huh. and it worked. Uh-huh. Please Beautiful. send us a voicemail. We would love to hear from yeah. you. And we would happily play that. That'd be cool. Yeah. So with that, we will let you all get along with your weekend. Mm-hmm. It is the new year. It is. It is. Thank you for spending your time with us. Yeah. Maybe they were listening while they were on the treadmill. They've gone what, 28 days without giving up their New Year's resolution? Okay, you guys made resolutions? No one gave me the minimum. (laughs) (laughs) I'm assuming. Yeah, I didn't know. I didn't know. So with that, we will let you all go a little bit more before we do. Where can people find you, Miche? You can find us at expansiveconnection.com. We would, you can just scroll down there and take a look at the coaches look at the offerings that we have. Um, We would love to be able to create work around what works for you and your relationship, have it tailored to you all. Um, And if you just need support, that's also what we're there for as well. Perfect. And you all can find me on our website, normalizingonmonogamy.com, where you also find the show notes. And in those show notes, you will find links to everything Miche just mentioned, as well as links to all of the resources, the community resources we threw out there 
for the first question. Yes. So me, Shay, and I will be back in a month at the end of February to answer more of your questions. Please send them in. Emma and I will be back next week for our regularly scheduled interview. And if you happen to be free tonight, that is January 26th, we are hosting, Emma and I are hosting our virtual meet and greet. We do these usually once a month. So you could definitely check that out. There's a banner right at the top of our website on how to sign up. And uh, maybe you could start finding some of that community so you're not alone. Beautiful. Perfect. We will see you all soon. Okay.